Hi readers, welcome back to Number the Stars by Lois Lowry. Today we're reading chapters 10 and 11. Let's remind ourselves of what took place in chapter 9. In chapter 9, Uncle Henrik reveals to Anne Marie that he and Mrs. Johansen are lying about Great Aunt Berta, but they do not tell Anne Marie any more than that. That night, people arrive to pay their respects to Great Aunt Berta including Ellen's parents and Peter Nielsen. Anne-Marie still does not know who is in the casket and what is really going on. Chapter 10. Let us open the casket. You are all here now, Uncle Henrik said, looking around the living room. I must go. Anne-Marie stood in the wide doorway, looking in from the hall. The baby slept now, and its mother looked tired. Her husband sat beside her, his arm across her shoulders. The old man's head was still bent. Peter sat alone, leaning forward with his elbows on his knees. It was clear that he was deep in thought. On the sofa, Ellen sat between her parents, one hand clasped tightly in her mother's. She looked up at Anne-Marie, but didn't smile. Anne-Marie felt a surge of sadness, the bond of their friendship had not broken, but it was as if Ellen had moved now into a different world, the world of her own family and whatever lay ahead for them. The elderly bearded man looked up suddenly as Uncle Henrik prepared to go. God keep you safe, he said in a firm but quiet voice. Henrik nodded. God keep us all safe, he replied. Then he turned and left the room. A moment later, Anne-Marie heard him leave the house. Mama brought the teapot from the kitchen and a tray of cups. Anne-Marie helped her pass the cups around. No one spoke. Anne-Marie, Mama whispered to her in the hall, you may go to bed if you want. It is very late. Anne-Marie shook her head, but she was tired. She could see that Ellen was too. Her friend's head was leaning on her mother's shoulder and her eyes closed now and then. Finally, Anne-Marie went to the empty rocking chair in the corner of the living room and curled there with her head against its soft, padded back. She dozed. She was startled from her half-sleep by the sudden sweep of headlights through the sheer curtains and across the room as a car pulled up outside. The car doors slammed. Everyone in the room tensed, but no one spoke. Readers, pay attention to how the mood, the tone, the atmosphere, that's how the setting feels. Pay attention to how the mood, the tone, the atmosphere changes here. The setting changes from a sleepy, somewhat calm mood, very suddenly, to a tense one. Join me back in the middle of the page. Let's reread that paragraph where the mood, the tone, the atmosphere, how it feels. Let's reread that paragraph where it changes. She was startled from her half-sleep by the sudden sweep of headlights through the sheer curtains and across the room as a car pulled up outside. The car doors slammed. Everyone in the room tensed, but no one spoke. She heard, as if in a recurring nightmare. Readers, when something is recurring, it means that it repeats. It happens over and over again. She heard, as if in a recurring nightmare, the pounding on the door, and then the heavy, frighteningly familiar staccato of boots on the kitchen floor. The woman with the baby gasped and began suddenly to weep. The male accented voice from the kitchen was loud. We have observed, he said, that an unusual number of people have gathered at this house tonight. What is the explanation? There has been a death, Mama's voice replied calmly. It is always our custom to gather and pay our respects when a family member dies. I am sure you are familiar with our customs. One of the officers pushed Mama ahead of him from the kitchen and entered the living room. There were others behind him. They filled the wide doorway. As always, their boots gleamed. 
their guns, their helmets, all of them gleamed in the candlelight. Emery watched as the man's eyes moved around the room. He looked for a long time at the casket. Then he moved his gaze, focusing on each person in turn. When his eyes reached her, she looked back at him steadily. Who died? he asked harshly. No one answered. They watched Anne-Marie, and she realized that the officer was directing the question at her. Readers, let's pause here for a moment. Why do you think the soldier chooses to ask Anne-Marie instead of any of the adults in the room? And how do you think Anne-Marie feels right now? Join me back in the middle of the page. Who died? He asked harshly. No one answered. They watched Anne-Marie, and she realized that the officer was directing the question at her. Now she knew for certain what Uncle Henrik had meant when he had talked to her in the barn. To be brave came more easily if you knew nothing. She swallowed. My great-aunt Bert, she lied in a firm voice. The officer moved forward suddenly across the room to the casket. He placed one gloved hand on its lid. Poor great aunt Berta, he said in a condescending voice. When your voice is condescending, it means that you are looking down on somebody else. Poor great aunt Berta, he said in a condescending voice. I do know your customs, he said, turning his gaze toward Mama, who still stood in the doorway. And I know it is the custom to pay one's respects by looking your loved one in the face. It seems odd to me that you have closed this coffin up so tightly. His hand was in a fist, and he rubbed it across the edge of the polished lid. Why is it not open? he demanded. Let us open it up and take one last look at Great Aunt Berta. Henry saw Peter across the room, stiffen in his chair, lift his chin, and reach slowly with one hand toward his side. Mama walked quickly across the room, directly to the casket, directly to the officer. You're right, she said. The doctor said it should be closed because Great Aunt Berta died of typhus, and he said that there was a chance the germs would still be there, would still be dangerous. But what does he know? Only a country doctor, and an old man at that? Surely typhus gem germs wouldn't linger in a dead person. And dear Aunt Berta, I have been longing to see her face, to kiss her goodbye. Of course we will open the casket. I am glad you suggested, with a swift motion, the Nazi officer slapped Mama across her face. She staggered backward, and a white mark on her cheek darkened. You foolish woman, he spat. To think that we have any interest in seeing the body of your diseased aunt. Open it after we leave, he said. With one gloved thumb, he pressed a candle flame into darkness. The hot wax spattered the table. Put all these candles out, he said, or pull the curtains. Then he strode to the doorway and left the room. Motionless, silent, one hand to her cheek. Mama listened. They all listened as the uniformed men left the house. In a moment, they heard the car doors, the sound of its engine, and finally they heard it drive away. Mama! Anne-Marie cried. Her mother shook her head quickly and glanced at the open window covered only by the sheer curtain. Anne-Marie understood. There might still be soldiers outside, watching, listening. Peter stood and drew the dark curtains across the windows. He relit the extinguished candle. Then he reached for the old Bible that had always been there on the mantel. He opened it quickly and said, I will read a psalm. Readers, a psalm is a sacred, a very important song from the Bible.
His eyes turned to the page he had opened at random, and he began to read in a strong voice, Oh, praise the Lord! How good it is to sing psalms to our God! How pleasant to praise him! The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem. He gathers in the scattered sons of Israel. It is he who heals the broken in spirit and binds up their wounds. He who numbers the stars one by one. Mama sat down and listened. Gradually, they each began to relax. Anne Marie could see the old man across the room, moving his lips as Peter read. He knew the ancient psalm by heart. Anne Marie didn't. The words were unfamiliar to her, and she tried to listen, tried to understand, tried to forget the war and the Nazis, tried not to cry, tried to be brave. The night breeze moved to the moved the dark curtains at the open windows. Outside, she knew, the sky was speckled with stars. How could anyone number them one by one, as the psalm said? There were too many. The sky was too big. Ellen had said that her mother was frightened of the ocean, that it was too cold and too big. The sky was too, thought Anne-Marie. The whole world was too cold, too big, and too cruel. Readers, to be cruel means to cause pain and suffering. The sky too, thought Anne-Marie. The whole world was too cold, too big, and too cruel. Peter read on in his firm voice, though it was clear he was tired. The long minutes passed. They seemed hours. Finally, still reading, he moved quietly to the window. He closed the Bible and listened to the quiet night. Then he looked around the room. Now, he said, it is time. First, he closed the windows. Then he went to the casket and opened the lid. Readers, there's a big theme that's coming through in Number the Stars right now. And this theme is that in difficult times, like in wars, difficult times like wars often cause children to grow up quickly. How do we see Anne-Marie growing up quickly? Hold on to this idea that difficult times like wars often cause children to grow up quickly as we read the next chapter. Chapter 11. Will we see you again soon, Peter? Anne-Marie blinked. Across the dark room, she saw Ellen, too, peering into the wooden box in surprise. There was no one in the casket at all. Instead, it seemed to be stuffed with folded blankets and articles of clothing. Readers, imagine what would have happened if the soldiers had opened the casket. Peter began to lift the things out and distribute them to the silent people in the room. He handed heavy coats to the man and wife and another to the old man with the beard. It will be very cold, he murmured. Put them on. He found a thick sweater for Mrs. Rosen and a woolen jacket for Ellen's father. After a moment of rummaging through the folded things, he found a smaller winter jacket and handed it to Ellen. Anne-Marie watched as Ellen took the jacket in her arms and looked at it. It was patched and worn. It was true that there had been few new clothes for anyone during the recent years, but still, Ellen's mother had always managed to make clothes for her daughter, often using old things that she was able to take apart and refashion in a way that made them seem brand new. Never had Ellen worn anything so shabby and old. But she put it on, pulled it around her, and buttoned the mismatched buttons. Peter, his arms full of the odd pieces of clothing, looked toward the silent couple with the infant. 
I'm sorry, he said to them. There is nothing for a baby. I'll find something, Mama said quickly. The baby must be warm. She left the room and was back in a moment with Kirsty's thick red sweater. Here, she said softly to the mother, it will be much too big, but that will make it even warmer for him. The woman spoke for the first time. Her, she whispered. She's a girl. Her name is Rachel. Mama smiled and helped her direct the sleeping baby's arms into the sleeves of the sweater. Together, they buttoned the heart-shaped buttons. How Kirsty loved that sweater with its heart buttons. Until the tiny child was completely encased in the warm red wool. Her eyelids fluttered, but she didn't wake. Peter reached into his pocket and took something out. He went to the parents and leaned down toward the baby. He opened the lid of the small bottle in his hand. How much does she weigh? Peter asked. She was seven pounds when she was born, the young woman replied. She's gained a little, but not very much. Maybe she weighs eight pounds now, no more. A few drops will be enough then. It has no taste. She won't even notice. The mother tightened her arms around the baby and looked up at Peter, pleading. Please, no, she said. She always sleeps all night. Please, she doesn't need it. I promise she won't cry. Peter's voice was firm. We can't take a chance, he said. He inserted the dropper of the bottle into the baby's tiny mouth and squeezed a few drops of liquid onto her tongue. The baby yawned and swallowed. The mother closed her eyes. Her husband gripped her shoulder. Readers, Lois Lowry hasn't told us yet exactly what is going on, but it seems dangerous. They have to wear warm clothes which were hidden in the casket, and the baby is being given medicine to keep her from crying. Peter, who is usually playful, speaks in a firm voice. Let's return to the text. Join me at the paragraph that starts with next, Peter. Next, Peter removed the folded blankets from the coffin one by one and handed them around. Carry these with you, he said. You will need them later for warmth. Anne Marie's mother moved around the room and gave each person a small package of food. The cheese and bread and apples that Anne Marie had helped her prepare in the kitchen hours before. Finally, Peter took a paper wrapped packet from the inside of his own jacket. He looked around the room at the assembled people now dressed in the bulky winter clothing and then motioned to Mr. Rosen, who followed him into the hall. Anne Marie could overhear their conversation. Mr. Rosen, Peter said, I must get this to Henrik, but I might not see him. I am going to take the others only to the harbor and they will go to the boat alone. I want you to deliver this. Without fail, it is of great importance. There was a moment of silence in the hall and Anne-Marie knew that Peter must have given the packet to Mr. Rosen. Anne-Marie could see it protruding from Mr. Rosen's pocket when he returned to the room and sat down again. She could see, too, that Mr. Rosen had a puzzled look. He didn't know what the packet contained. He hadn't asked. It was one more time, Anne-Marie realized, when they protected one another by not telling. If Mr. Rosen knew, he might be frightened. If Mr. Rosen knew, he might be in danger. So he hadn't asked, and Peter hadn't explained. Readers, here is this theme that has come up again, that it is easier to be brave when you don't know everything. Keep this in mind as we continue reading. Now, Peter said, looking at his watch, I will lead the first group, you, you, and you. He gestured to the old man and to the young couple with their baby. Ing, he said, 
Anne-Marie realized that it was the first time that she had heard Peter Nielsen call her mother by her first name. Before, it had always been Mrs. Johansson, or in the old days during the merriment and excitement of his engagement to Lees, it had been occasionally Mama. Now it was Ing. It was as if he had moved beyond his own youth and had taken his place in the world of adults. Her mother nodded and waited for his instructions. Readers, Peter is changing too. It seems like everyone is changing. In chapter nine, we thought about how difficult times like wars make children grow up quickly. It seems like difficult times push everyone to change. Relationships between people have to change too. You wait 20 minutes and then bring the Rosens. Don't come sooner. We must be separate on the path so there is less chance of being seen. Mrs. Johansson nodded again. Come directly back to the house after you have seen the Rosens safely to Henrik. Stay in the shadows and on the back path. You know that, of course. By the time you get the Rosens to the boat, Peter went on, I will be gone. As soon as I deliver my group, I must move on. There is other work to be done tonight. He turned to Anne-Marie. So I will say goodbye to you now. Anne-Marie went to him and gave him a hug. But will we see you again soon, she asked. I hope so, Peter said. Very soon. Don't grow much more, or you will be taller than I am, little long legs. Anne-Marie smiled. But Peter's comment was no longer the light-hearted fun of the past. It was only a brief grasp at something that had gone. Peter kissed Mama wordlessly. Then he wished the Rosens Godspeed, and he led the others through the door. Mama, Anne-Marie, and the Rosens sat in silence. There was a slight commotion outside the door, and Mama went quickly to look out. In a moment, she was back. It's all right, she said in response to their looks. The old man stumbled, but Peter helped him up. He didn't seem to be hurt. Maybe just his pride, she added, smiling a bit. Readers, pride is a feeling of self-respect. It's a way of feeling good about yourself. It was an odd word, pride. Anne-Marie looked at the Rosens sitting there, wearing the misshapen, ill-fitting clothing, holding ragged blankets folded in their arms, their faces drawn and tired. She remembered the earlier, happier times. Mrs. Rosen, her hair neatly combed and covered, lighting the Sabbath candles, saying the ancient prayer. And Mr. Rosen, sitting in the big chair in their living room, studying his thick books, correcting papers, adjusting his glasses, looking up now and then to complain good-naturedly about the lack of decent light. She remembered Ellen in the school play, moving confidently across the stage, her gestures sure, her voice clear. All of those things, those sources of pride, the candlesticks, the books, the daydreams of theater, had been left behind in Copenhagen. They had nothing with them now. There was only the clothing of unknown people for warmth, the food from Henrik's farm for survival, and the dark path ahead through the woods to freedom. Anne-Marie realized, though she had not really been told, that Uncle Henrik was going to take them in his boat across the sea to Sweden. She knew how frightened Mrs. Rosen was of the sea, its width, its depth, its cold. She knew how frightened Ellen was of the soldiers with their guns and boots who were certainly looking for them. And she knew how frightened they all must be of the future. But their shoulders were as straight as they had been in the past, in the classroom, on the stage, at the Sabbath table. So there were other sources, too, of pride, and they had not left everything behind. Readers, we have come to the end of these two chapters, and we've come again to this theme, that difficult times make children grow up very quickly. 
How do we see this in Anne-Marie? 